Welcome CIS 1400 and welcome to module 3 where we are of course going to be talking about programming modules. So I'm going to break this uh, module up into about four different videos. Uh, the first one is going to be quick where I talk about just modules in general and about the reading. If you have not done the reading for chapter 3 yet, I would highly suggest that you go back, stop now, and read that chapter really quickly so that you can have a better idea of what we're talking about and discussing in this video. Uh, if you've already done that, then please feel free to continue with the video. Uh, in video 2, 3, and 4, what we'll be doing is taking a real-world problem and breaking it down into pseudocode, flowchart, and finally a Python file that executes the modules that we create in the third and uh, or the second and third videos. So uh, make sure you watch all four videos in the series. I'll try to keep them as short as possible and um, it'll allow you to get going with your assignment this week and with the quiz at the end of the week. So let's get into it. Uh, modules. Modules are a group of programming statements within a program that perform a specific task. What we like to do is try to break our programs down into things that it can do, tangible pieces. So what we often say is one task in your program means you have one module in your program. So for every one task that you have to complete, you create a module for. There are actually two different kinds of modules in a program. You would have what we might call modules modules or um, in many programming languages methods or functions that will um, just do some work for you. We might call these void functions or void methods and then you have modules that will not only do something for you but return information back to the program so that you can use it later on or in different ways. We would call those return functions or return methods. Um, in this particular um, module uh, we're going to be talking about the first kind void methods that just do work for us oftentimes just display information in chapter six we'll start talking about those return functions so um, I'll often say um, the words function for modules, sometimes methods for modules, but other words might also be subroutines or procedures. Um, modules will help us break our program down into abstractions and it kind of helps us with this idea of top-down design where we don't have to think about the finer details right off the bat, we can think about the big ideas and then start breaking it down from there. When we start using modules, you're going to start to see that your code becomes a lot simpler to use. You can start reusing your code um, when you have a module you want to use over and over and over again. It makes for testing a lot easier because now you can test small subsets of code. It brings faster development uh, through the facilitation of teamwork because now I can say, hey, I would need you, uh, Team A, to go work on this particular part of the project and Team B to go work on this other part. And then we can start bringing it together so that it fits off an entire program. So modules are pretty simple to make. First thing we need to talk about is how to define it. Uh, when you name a module, I like to keep the words verb-like in nature, something like get price or split name. Uh, we should always start a module with a lowercase letter. And then if it requires more than one word, you can do a couple of things. You can camel case, like I did here in get pricing and split name, uh, where you simply capitalize every subsequent word. So keep the first one completely lowercase and then capitalize the first letter of the next words as it goes through. Or you can use underscores, but what you cannot do is use spaces in module names. As soon as you throw a space in between the names, uh, in between the words in a module name, you'll throw errors with your programs, no problem. Um, one thing you'll also see that you end uh, all your modules with is a set of parentheses. These parentheses may or may not contain information. Um, you'll see modules that do and modules that don't throughout this, uh, something like get name or find net pay or a split name. They may not um, need information, but throughout the examples that we do in the second, third, and fourth videos, you'll see per, or, um, modules that require information be placed in and that information will be called a parameter. So when you're looking at a module, you're going to see three different parts. You're going to see the header, something where it's the name of the module followed up by a set of parentheses. Then inside the module, uh, we'll write statements of code or pseudocode. Um, 
as many as we may need, and then you'll see something at the very bottom of the module, it'll say end of module, or maybe it'll be a return state when we start getting into chapter six and we start talking about return functions. So maybe I've got something here where it's like module main, which is really what we've been doing so far is writing our main method. It might display something like I have a message for you, call another module, show message and display, that's all folks. So we can start to see how this is all going to work work. When we have modules made and we would like to use them in our program, we'll use this keyword call here to kind of signify that we are accessing another part of our program. Okay. When you're flow charting a module, it's pretty simple. Um, instead of using like start and stop, you might use the module name and the word end as it goes through. Your symbols don't change a whole lot. The only other symbol you might use is a predefined process symbol, which will be like a rectangle with either two vertical bars on the side or two horizontal bars above it, depending on what flow chart creator you're working with. Again, remember there's no defined, definite rules here. It's just a matter of conveying our message so that we can at least somewhat be clear and consistent with it. So when I have this, I've got my method main, I might display, I have a message for you, and then I'm going to call a subroutine or a message here. It says show message, which means I'm going to come over here and find a module with the same name. I'm going to start running through its code. Notice the module doesn't have an end at the end. It has a return word because this wants me to go back to where I came from when it's all said and done, return back to the flow of the program, and then finally say, hey, display, that's all folks. Um, modules, once you're comfortable writing them, are going to help us write our programs a whole lot easier. We can use a program known as top-down design or stepwise refinement. Um, you might think of it also as abstracting your program so that you can start to think about it into its larger chunks. So you might have a program that does some sort of um, payroll information for a company. Well, you might have to get some input and then that'll help you calculate the number of hours worked and the hourly pay rate. You might calculate gross pay and overtime pay and withholdings and net pay and taxes and benefits and all sorts of stuff. And all of these things can be broken down into other modules. And this hierarchy chart that I have here really kind of shows you what the modules are within the program and which modules call which other modules. It doesn't tell you anything about the details of the modules, like what they return or anything like that, but it will at least show you what modules you might have in the program itself and which ones are going to be accessed by the others as you go through. So I can see get input actually accesses the get hours worked and get hourly pay. It makes calls to these two. The calculate withholdings makes calls to calculate taxes and calculate benefits. Okay, Whereas calculate net, P, net pay doesn't actually call anything. It just does the work that it needs to do. So now I can start to see my project as uh, larger chunks rather than trying to see it in its finest details right off from the get-go. When you're building your modules, you have to worry about variables um, and the scope of those variables. Last week we talked about variables being a namespace and memory. And we still have variables in our programs, but we're going to have different types of variables. Most of the variables we made in the last modules, module 2 work, last week's work, were what we called um, global variables per se. They were variables that we could use anywhere we wanted in the program. But our program didn't really have modules, so the program was just the script that we wrote. This module um, in this week uh, will have different areas of our program that we'll have to talk about. So we'll have our main method or our main module. We might have other modules, other subroutines that are called from the main module. Each one of these modules individually can have their own variables built within it. And each of these variables have something called scope. We have two kinds of scope, local scope and global scope. Local scope of a variable is when a variable is defined in a module, it can only be used and accessed from within that module. This gives us a lot of benefits. Um, one, we can name many variables the exact same thing as long as they don't share the exact same scope. Um, it allows us to use the same word over and over and over again if we need to because it might be a meaningful identifier for several different variables within several different modules, which is really kind of nice. Um, it also helps us not um, mix up values from one method to the next or one module to the next. The other kind of variable we might have is something called a global variable that has what we call global scope. Uh, this variable would be defined outside of any module and 
being defined outside of any module gives us some advantages as well. If we can do that, then we can also use it and access it inside any module we want. This has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. Its benefits would obviously be that uh, every module can kind of share the same information. But as soon as we start using many, many global variables, then that kind of restricts us in the names that we can have for our variables, because again, we can't name two variables the same that share the same scope. Um, it also, depending on the programming language and how information is passed, could have detrimental effects where you might start editing the value of a global variable uh, when you really don't want to, or modifying it in one method call versus another, and it might go back and forth and back and forth between different values, and now you have to try to keep straight what it possibly is at each point stage in your program. Local var variables are often um, more desirable to use than global variables, but there are purposes for global variables, mostly for named constants, things like maybe a tax rate um, or a um, uh, uh, any kind of hard-coded value that you might need into your program um, that you would rather have named rather than just using that value each and every time it pops up. So th that would be the first advantage to a global variable. Other than that, you should be using mostly local variables for most everything that you do. Okay, so as I said before, local variables are declared inside a module. Um, those variables can only be used in the module that they're declaring. Um, the variables are created in memory once the module is called and removed from memory once the module is ended. So once you use the module, you're only staging memory for that module's usage. Uh, when you have a global variable, that memory is saved from the start of the program and stays till the end of the program. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. Okay. All right, now other types of variables are going to be what we call parameters and arguments. And you'll see a lot of textbooks use the word parameter to uh, mean both things. Anytime I talk or, or speak to you, I would like to use parameters to be um, those variables that are found in the method heading and to be used within a method or module body. Um, I like to use the word arguments instead for the information that is going to be passed to a parameter through the method call. So for instance, over here on the left hand side, I have parameters, parameters of length and width in a module called find area. I defined length and width in the parentheses of the module heading. And what that does is it creates two local variables that I can use within the module itself. When I need to use the module, say find area, I make a call to find area and I supply it with information to be passed to the parameters length and width. These are what I would call then arguments because I can forcefully tell length to be what it needs to be and forcefully tell width what it needs to be throughout the execution of that module. Um, these do not have to be strict values like five and three. They could be other variables that are holding value. They could even be other module calls once we learn in chapter six return functions um, that will return a value to us that can work. The one thing that you need to make sure of, and that hopefully was uh, pointed out to you in the reading, um, you need to make sure that whatever module you define in the parameter list that you have, you match it equally in quantity for the number of arguments. So if I have two parameters here, I need to make sure that when I call the method, I supply it with two arguments. You also need to make sure that whatever data type these parameters are going to be, let's say length and width are both real numbers, I supply it with real numbers in my arguments as well. If these are going to be integers, then I make sure I only supply it with integers. If you mix the data types, you will usually end up with errors uh, depending on the data type because it may not be compatible with the type of work that you're trying to do. If you miss out on quantity, if I only provide it with one argument instead of two, it's not going to know what to do with the width parameter. So you do need to make sure that you pass things in quantity and by type correctly anytime you are making a method call based upon the method heading that you have going. So I always like to tell uh, my students that it kind of looks like a quarterback passing to a wide receiver. The wide receiver is the um, method heading 
it will define how it's supposed to be, and the quarterback will yell the arguments and tell them exactly what it needs to do. It will finally pass whatever we have from the argument list to the parameter list one at a time. What you'll notice also is that these words do not actually have to match if you are passing things by variable assignment. So you could put something down here that says len and wid, uh, where you are actually passing to it a variable called length and width, as long as the length and width contain values that are compatible with the parameter list down here. The last thing that I want you to make sure that you're fully aware of with the um, modules and how information gets passed by a parameter is whether it's passed by value or by reference. And I actually think that this little um, animation here does a really good job explaining what is happening when you go by reference or by value. Programming languages are set up to pass and accept information in two different ways, um, by reference or by value. When you pass something by reference, what you are technically doing is passing the exact memory address location of the argument to the method parameter. So any adjustments you make to the parameter in the method are also made outside of the method to the argument that you actually used. So you can see here that if I were to pass a cup uh, an empty cup to a method called fill cup, and I actually go through and fill that cup through the method somewhere, that the actual cup that was outside of the method got filled as well. Okay? I've changed the value of this particular argument through whatever instructions were in the fill cup method. On its opposite side, we have pass by value. Pass by value does not pass an exact like memory address location uh, or reference to the um, variable or argument that you're passing. So here's what happens in a pass by value situation. What happens is if I have this cup um, argument and I pass this to the fill cup method, what I get instead is a copy of it, not the actual piece. And when I pass through the same statements that were over here, the cup gets filled in the method or in the module, but the actual argument that was outside the module that began this whole thing um, doesn't have anything done to it. It doesn't fill in the least. So any modifications I make in a pass by value type situation, the modifications never actually get made within the um, actual argument as we go. Um, Python is a little weird. Um, Python actually doesn't do either of these things. Python, which we're learning, passes by object, and it can be a little tricky to figure out how it works sometimes until you get kind of into it. Um, it all depends on what the argument is, on whether or not it's seemingly passed by reference or by value. And it all comes down to whether or not the object is mutable or immutable. So for instance, if I were to pass a full-blown object into something and modify it, it will actually pass by reference and modify it appropriately. Um, but if I don't uh, pass an object and I pass something more of a primitive data type, it will more or less do it by value and pass a copy. Um, a lot of programming, all programming languages are set up a little bit differently. You really have to know your programming language as to whether or not it passes by value or passes by reference, or it does kind of a hybrid approach depending on what it is. Uh, a lot of object-oriented languages are almost at this hybrid approach where you have to really know what type of information you are passing in order to understand whether or not it's by reference or by value. So for me to explain to you that this is always this way and this is the other, it's near impossible for me to do that. You really have to understand the programming language that you're going to work with. Since we're going to work with Python, I really can't say that it passes by reference or by value, and you're going to have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis as to what is going to happen to the argument as you go. Um, I'll give you some examples of that as the um, we get into the Python examples and show you how that all works. Um, but for now, that is 
basically it for modules and parameters and arguments. Realistically, all we're looking to make sure that you understand out of this particular unit is that modules are going to be small subsections of code within your overall program that are there to um, make things easier for you, to break it up into chunks so that for every task that you have in a program, you have a single module for. As we start introducing more complex modules in units or chapter six, you'll start to see more of their benefits and how they're gonna relate. Um, but for now, let's get into some examples. Um, in the next video that you watch, we'll throw out an example at you that deals in um, some sales tax for a particular uh, store, and we'll figure out how we're going to pseudocode that up and flowchart it and code it out in Python. So we'll see you in the next video.